This is our 11th session on electrostatics and circuits. So what we're going to do this time is start off with a free response question and then jump into some multiple choice. So uh, as we usually do, go ahead and pause the video, work the free response question, and then turn it back on and we'll check it. And I'll talk about the things that we need at, to answer this question as we go along. So for this question, we have some students who want to know what get used up in an incandescent bulb when it's in series with a resistor. So, what we will be doing is putting an incandescent light bulb in series with a resistor. We'll be looking at the current, the energy, or, or both things. And they come up with the following two questions. And it's important to keep in mind Students are really after current and energy. And then here are their two questions. In one second, do fewer electrons leave the bulb than enter the bulb? This is ultimately asking about current. And number two, does the electric potential energy of the electrons change while they're inside the bulb? That's ultimately asking about energy. Uh, what's gonna be really helpful when we're dealing with this is that um, saying electric potential energy of electrons, that means the voltage. Or to be more precise, the potential difference. Say the voltage. Okay, so let's talk about some things real quick then. Current is defined as, we use an I for it, and it's charge per unit time. So current is the amount of charge passing through a point as a function of time or passing through a point per second. That's what's meant by uh, current when we talk about it. So if we look at a wire, for our purposes, there are a couple of relevant things going on. There's some junk in the way in the wire. We'll say all this blue stuff is quote unquote junk in the way. The way we measure that junk that's in our way is by saying it's resistance. And then inside of our wire, we have electrons. So, junk in the way and electrons. When we connect this to a battery, creates an electric field inside of the wire that causes the electrons to experience a force. So these electrons will accelerate because we're connected to a battery, but if we just, if we look at the path of one electron, it's gonna run into something, bump, come back, 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 run into something, bump, come back. And so what happens is,
individual electrons move slowly. at some constant drift velocity. And all the electrons move at once. It's like being in really, really heavy traffic. When the cars go, they all go at the same time. And uh, because the wire is full of electrons, all of the electrons move at the same rate. And since electrons, uh, the rate of the movement of electrons or the amount of charge passing a point at a given time uh, is current, that means for one wire or for one loop, for one wire, for one loop of a circuit, um, all points have the same current moving through them. And if we have loops, well, I don't see. If wires join together, their currents add. If a wire splits, the current the current splits evenly. So we have one very important rule that comes out of this idea of current. Well, we have two things that kind of feed into this idea of, of current. It's the conservation of charge. Essentially, we have to have the same charge going in to a point as we have coming out of a point. Same amount of charge in and out of a point. That's conservation of charge. Relevant for us, charge is not created or destroyed. Put a little asterisk by that. There is, when we're talking about nuclear reactions, there is an opportunity for charges to be made, but in that case, net charge is not created or destroyed. But when we're talking about circuits, we can kind of simplify that and say, we can't, we can't make charges. Charges already exist inside of our wires. We're not creating charge, we're just moving it. That's all that's happening. And since we're moving it, we can't, we can't get any more or less charge than we had before. We're just pushing it through. Um, and so, We have Kirchhoff's loop rule. So that kind of talks about conservation of charge in terms of current. When a wire splits, the current has to be the same on, on that's not the loop rule. 
I apologize. When the current splits, the, the when a wire splits, the current has to be the same in and out. This is the node rule. So if there's no split in the current, there's no change. I'm sorry, if there's no split in the wire, there's no change in the current. The other idea that we have governing what's going on is the conservation of energy. In a loop of wire, a continuous circuit, the total change in energy must be zero. So if we look at a really simple circuit, this is a battery, this is a resistor, that's a single loop. So if we start here, move through the battery and move across the resistor, the electrons are the thing that move through the battery, move through the circuit. So electrons gain energy from the battery. They lose energy as they move across a resistor. This loop rule says that all of the energy they gain from a battery must be lost as they move around the circuit. So, talking about energy, in circuits we generally don't talk about the amount of joules that something has. It's not the most convenient thing to look at. Um, so, what we talk about in a circuit is something different. It's energy per electron. So, if we look at energy over charge, that's voltage. The way we measure energy in a circuit is voltage. That is the essentially energy per electron that we have going on. So if we want to see what's going on with the energy, we're talking about voltage. So all of this is Kirchhoff's loop rule. Loop rule says that our net energy as we go around a loop of a circuit is going to have to be zero. That's our loop rule. But this is what we talk about when we're talking about energy in a circuit and when we talk about electrons in a circuit. So, we have these two questions. In one second, do fewer electrons leave the bulb than enter the bulb? And does the electric potential energy of electrons change while inside the bulb? Those are the two questions we're going to answer. So here's what the students have. An adjustable power source, wire, light bulbs, resistors, switches, voltmeters, ammeters, and other standard equipment. Voltmeter measures volt voltage, ammeter measures current. Um, assume the, the power supply and voltmeters are marked in point one 
volt and 0 0.01 amp increments. Meaning if we adjust it, that's how much we can adjust uh, at any given point. And that's how accurate we can, we can see what's going on there. So describe an experimental procedure you could use to answer questions one and two above. State the measurements you would make and how you would use the equipment to make them. Include a neat labeled diagram of your setup. So for our setup, we're going to build a circuit. So we're going to have our adjustable power supply. You could either draw that as a battery or as essentially saying, all right, we have a power supply. I'm going to do a battery. Either one is acceptable. Uh, we got a battery. And what we want is an incandescent bulb in series with the resistor. That's what has to be in our circuit. So here's our resistor. It's going to be attached to an incandescent bulb. All of those things are in series. Now, can't measure anything with that. So here are the things I want to measure. In one second, do fewer electrons leave the bulb then enter the bulb. That's the current. So what I need to do is measure the current going into the bulb, put an ammeter before we get to the bulb. And I'll put an ammeter after we leave the bulb. That's going to allow me to see the current before we get to the bulb and the current after we get to the bulb. And just as a good rule to know, Ammeters are in series with whatever we want to measure. We need to measure the current through something. We want the current to run through our ammeter. And then looking at the bulb, we want to measure the voltage on either side of it. So the voltmeter has to go in parallel. The voltmeter measures the change in voltage between two points. goes around whatever we're measuring. That's why we have to draw it that way. So I've got this thing labeled. I've got a power supply, a resistor, a bulb, and then two ammeters on either side of the bulb and a voltmeter around the bulb. So I have to describe my experimental procedure. Set up the circuit, state the measurements you would make, uh, and how you would use the equipment to make them. So we're going to measure the current on each side of the bulb. with ammeters. We're going to measure the voltage on each side of the bulb with the voltmeter. And that's all we need to do to answer those two questions. This is all we need to say. I don't need to go into the explanation of why I'm doing those things. When I'm describing an experimental procedure, especially for the college board, I would say just describe the measurements that you're making. Don't go into why. Don't go into analysis. That's not what's happening here. That's what's happening in the next part. 
Explain how the data from your experiment can be used to answer question one above. So, question one is in one second, do fewer electrons leave than enter? So, the ammeters measure the current into and out of the bulb. Current is a measure of charge per unit time. So, by comparing the current before and after the bulb, we can see how much charge, how many electrons entered, and how many left. If the current is the same, the same number of electrons entered and left the bulb. If the current's not the same, then the same number of electrons did not enter and leave. That's kind of all I have to say about that. Explain how the data can be used to answer question two above. Question two says, uh, question two wants to know, does the electric potential energy of electrons change while inside the bulb? So, the voltmeter measures difference in voltage between two points. That's the whole point of the voltmeter. Voltage is energy, specifically, voltage is potential energy. Per unit charge. Voltage tells me how much energy each electron has. So if the voltage or the energy is the same before and after the bulb, They have the same energy. The voltmeter will read zero. If they are not the same, the voltmeter will not read zero. So we don't even have to say which one of those things is correct in this question. All we have to do is talk about how we would measure it. Now, uh, we know that electrons don't get used up. We can't destroy charge. So we expect to, uh, in part B, we know that the ammeters will be the same. You're going to have the same current before and after the bulb because the same number of electrons enter the bulb as leave the bulb. A light bulb or a resistor or any other circuit element does not destroy charge. Charge moves through there. What happens is that those charges lose energy.
The voltmeter will not be equal to zero. It will not read zero. We don't, we don't have the same energy. As an electron moves through this bulb, it's going to lose energy. That's what's happening with the electrons in the bulb. That's why it lights up. Electrons are not going away. Electrons are dropping off their energy. That's making the bulb hot and light up. A light bulb is non-ohmic if the resistance changes as a function of current. We're going to modify that setup to determine whether the light bulb is non-ohmic. So, here's the deal. We cannot measure resistance as a function of anything. We can't directly measure resistance. But what we can do is use Ohm's law to do it. Now, here's kind of the experimental part of this problem. The first part was a little bit experimental, but this is kind of more of a traditional sequence um, for an AP experimental question. Draw your setup. How will you collect data? How will you analyze your data? For an experimental question, you need to start with the analysis piece. I'm going to write that out to the side. It's not the order that it's written in, but this is the order that makes the most logical sense as you work through the problem. Start with the analysis. By looking at the analysis piece of this, it's going to tell you what you need to measure. By knowing what you need to measure, it's going to tell you what your experimental setup should be. So the first thing that you should do is the analysis. The first thing that you should do is the analysis. The second thing that you should do is what data do you need? And the third thing that you should do is modify or create your experimental setup but always start with the analysis so we want to determine whether the light bulb is non-ohmic so for ohmic resistance is constant with our current For non-ohmic, resistance changes. Now, based on the equipment we have, ohmmeters and voltmeters, we can only measure V and I. So to analyze, what we're going to do is graph the only things that we can measure. We're going to graph the voltage versus the current. Now, from Ohm's law, V is equal to I R. So if we graph those two things, Resistance is my slope. So according to V equals IR, resistance is my slope. Since we can only measure V and I, we're going to graph voltage versus current. A straight line means We have constant resistance. Curved line or a changing slope means the slope or the resistance
changes. So my analysis is going to be a graph of potential and current. And we're going to look at how the slope of that line changes or does not change. So what data do I need? I'm going to make a graph of current versus uh, potential. What I need is Uh, what I need is multiple values of current through the bulb and the change in voltage across the bulb. Practically, what that means is that we will um, adjust we will adjust the power supply to change the voltage and current multiple times. we have to have some change. That's an important part to how we measure things. We can't just measure one thing and see what's going on. We have to measure this over and over and over again. We have to have, since we have 0.1 volts, we have to change it 0.1 volts from our power supply on and on and on to see how that changes the voltage and the current through the bulb. Now, if I'm just collecting current and voltage information about the bulb, Really, we need no change to our setup, right? Our setup has a power supply, a resistor, an ammeter on both sides of the bulb. So that's going to tell me the current going through the bulb uh, and then a voltmeter across it. That's going to give me all the data I need. There's no change to the setup, but what we will be doing is um, we will adjust the power supply to get different data. That's our experiment. Again, I think it makes uh, more logical sense to move backwards through the problem uh, than it does to start with the setup and move towards analysis. It's always good to know where you're going doing the analysis first. Now, I left out a part. It was talk about uncertainties in our measurement. So, Here's the issue. If the deviations of voltage and, or sorry, not the deviations, if the uncertainties of current and voltage from the meter can show both linear and nonlinear data, um, we need more accurate equipment. We can't make a determination, basically. To eliminate that, we need to take enough data points to get beyond the plus or minus one volt and plus or minus um, point zero, sorry, plus or minus a tenth of a volt and plus or minus a one hundredth of an amp. 
So practically what that looks like, if we're making this graph, if we have error bars on our measurements, and those error bars can include both ways of interpreting our data, we're no good. However, taking enough data points with those error bars can eliminate sort of the closeness of our data. So it's important to take data over a wide range of values. Now we have our multiple choice. As we've done multiple choice in the past, please read the question, work through the question, and then we will come back and answer the question together. Free response took a while, so we'll see how far we get. Number one, the figure shows three identical bulbs connected to a battery with constant voltage. What happens to the brightness of bulb one when the switch is closed? So, right now, initially, oh, it's black. we have current running through bulb one and bulb two. So each one has the same amount of energy dropped off across it. When I add bulb three, this part is now a parallel connection. And the current splits right here. So that means uh, two things, okay? Parallel connection means one thing, current splits means another thing. A parallel connection Resistors in parallel add a little strangely. One over the total resistance of things in parallel is one over R plus one over R. Really, what that means is that in a parallel connection, total resistance decreases. So the resistance of this piece goes down, right? So when we add that parallel connection, the total resistance of bulbs two and three, instead of being just the resistance of bulb two, I have less than the resistance of bulb two in my circuit. So what that means is the total resistance of the circuit decreases, which means total current increases And looking at this, the total current because bulb one is in series with the battery, the total current moves through bulb one. And since I get more current through bulb one, it gets brighter. That's one thing that happens. So the brightness of bulb one will increase permanently. So we've answered the question. Now, what I'd like to do is talk about what it means to have the current split um, for bulb two. Current splits, that's the second thing. So, the 
current must go through both one and two. So I have now less than the total current and really it's half of the total current since they're identical. Less than the total current goes through bulb two. And even though the total current is greater than it was before, half of that total current is still less than what we had before. That gets dimmer. Here's another way of looking at what's going on. So, we have our, our voltmeter, we have bulb, we call them one and two, okay, we have bulb one, we have bulb two, and then we have kind of an open switch for bulb three, same picture. So what I want to do is look at um, node rules and loop rules to see how that kind of helps things going on. Loops. Now what we said for loops was that the total change in voltage had to be zero. So our first loop, we're going to go across the voltmeter through bulb one and through bulb two. Right, so zero is equal to the voltage we gain from the battery minus the voltage we lose from bulb one minus the voltage we lose from bulb two. The other loop we're going to have, we'll do that in a different color so that we can see it. Still have to go through bulb one. This time we're going to go through bulb three. And I understand that that's not a complete circuit. Follow me on this though. So zero is equal to the voltage we gain from the battery minus the voltage from bulb one minus now the voltage from bulb three. Well, that's not very helpful. So I'm going to have to use Ohm's law to kind of flesh that out a little bit. Voltage one is going to be current through bulb one times the resistance of bulb one. Same resistance, so we're just going to use R. Voltage 2 is going to be the current through bulb 2 times the resistance, and voltage 3 is the current through bulb 3 times that identical resistance. So I want to put that in my loops to compare what's going on. So for my first loop, I got 0 is equal to the voltage from the battery minus current 1 through that resistor minus current 2 through that resistor. Uh, and then, I'm gonna write it underneath, but for the second loop, it's voltage minus current one through the first resistor, minus current three through the second resistor. I'm sorry, through the third resistor. That's what's, that's what's going on right here. And then we have the node rule that's going to kind of help us interpret what's going on. For the node rule, there's my node. I've got current one coming into it, and I've got current two and current three coming out of it. So to begin with, There is a break in the wire here at current three. So there is no current three. So really there is no second loop. And so to begin, our first setup, I1 is equal to I2. That's what we get from the node rule. And from the loop rule, um, zero equals voltage minus I1 R1 minus I2 R2. Since everything is the same from what we've said, 
Those have the same current and the same change in voltage. In the second situation, when we close the switch, I3 is not zero. So when the switch is closed, I1 is I2 plus I3. So right away, we can see that I2 is smaller than it was before. Right? It's no longer equal to I1. It's less than I1. And now we have our loop rules. So, just by looking at that, that fact that I2 is now split, this piece goes down, so the voltage through I2 goes down, which means I1 must go up. I1 has to go up, and since this piece represents the same voltage, you're going to have to have the same voltage across I2 and I3. It's just another way of looking what's going on. It's a little bit more complicated, but it's grounding us in those ideas of conservation of energy and conservation of charge. In the circuit shown in the figure, all the light bulbs are identical. Which is the correct ranking of the brightness of the bulbs? So looking at this circuit, I have the voltage of my battery. I go around the circuit. And from that loop, I can see that all of my voltage is dropped on bulb A. So the current for bulb A is going to be the, vo the voltage of the battery divided by that resistance. Right? It's, it's all of the voltage being dropped there, not, not some of it. If we look at if we look at the other loop, some of the voltage is dropped across ball B. The rest of the voltage is dropped across bulb C. Since they're identical, it's going to be half. So some voltage is dropped at B or C. So the current through B is going to be half of the voltage divided by the resistance. That's less current, so it's going to be less bright. A is the brightest, B and C have equal brightness, but less than A. B and C have to have equal brightness because they're in series. And they have the same current running through them, and we're told that they're identical resistors. Number three, in the circuit shown in the figure, four identical res resistors labeled A and D are connected to the battery as shown. Switch one, switch two, or switches. Which would result in the greatest amount of current through resistor A? So, Resistor A receives the total current through the battery because it is in series with the battery.
total current is largest, which is what we're going for. when the total resistance is smallest. B, C, and D, when they're all connected, are gonna be in parallel. So their total will be smallest when all are connected. So when all of these things are in parallel, they have the smallest resistance. So what I want to have all switches closed. I'll close both switches to make that happen. Number four, a light bulb is connected in the circuit with the switch open. All the connecting, so none of the wires have resistance and the battery has no resistance. When we close the switch, which describes the behavior of the circuit? So I have a light bulb connected to R1 in series. And then when I close the circuit, these two are in parallel. This is just like number one. So, closing the circuit decreases the total resistance of the circuit. R2 and R3 are in parallel now, and so that parallel section has less resistance than just the series section before. As total current, I'm sorry, as total resistance decreases, total current increases. Total current goes through the bulb, so it gets brighter. So the brightness of the bulb will increase. That's one thing that's going to happen. Now it's talking about the potential drop or, or how much voltage goes across R2 and we need to know what happens there. Since all those resistors are well doesn't matter. R2 receives less current, so it doesn't say that they're identical. It receives less current than the total because it splits. So less current is less voltage drop, less potential drop. So the potential drop across R2 will decrease. That's what happens when we split our circuit. Number five, two light bulbs are connected to a battery. What happens to the brightness of bulb one when we close this switch? Well, bulb one is along this loop. If we close the switch, then we also get current through this loop, but
there's no change in that top loop when the switch is closed, right? We have the same resistance in the loop. We have the same battery, so we have the same voltage in the loop. Which means we have the same current in the loop. There are no changes. So when we do that, the brightness of bulb one is not going to change. Number six, I want to know the current through the nine ohm resistor. The best way to look at this is one sort of, is just by looking at loops. That's one complete loop. So that tells me in that loop, we're going to gain voltage from the battery. We're going to lose voltage from the three ohm and we're going to lose voltage from the nine ohm. Kirchhoff loop, right? So since V equals IR, that's the voltage we lose across the three ohm resistor. And this is the voltage we lose across the nine ohm resistor. Now, they're in series, or at least the three ohm and the nine ohm are, they're on the same wire. So I know that I1 is equal to I2. So my Kirchhoff loop now looks like zero equals eight minus three I minus nine I. So I've got zero equals eight minus 12 times the current, add them together. That's telling me that the total resistance of that part, this this chunk is 12 ohms. And so eight is equal to 12 I. And so my current is eight over 12. That gives me about 0.67 amps. Number seven, this is an induction question. It just has to do with how charges move. So X and Y are two uncharged metal spheres and they're in contact with each other. We bring a positively charged rod close to X as shown. Now, we know that that positively charged rod will attract electrons to it and push, push the positive charges away. I know in real life that positive charges don't move, but it's convenient to think of it this way. Really what happens is the electrons are attracted to the positive rod and it leaves behind a positive charge. For practical purposes, it's pushing the positives away and bringing the negatives towards it. So what we have is a polarized system. Because some of the, neg the negatives attracted to the rod Positives are pushed away. If we leave the rod there and separate the two, the negatives stay on X and they leave, uh, they leave Y. So X is going to remain negatively charged. Y is going to be positively charged. So what are the final charge states of X and Y? X is negative and Y is positive. Two identical small spheres are a certain distance apart and each one experiences a force of F. With time, charge leaks off both spheres. When each sphere has lost half its initial charge, what's the magnitude of the electrostatic force? Okay, so electric force is extremely similar to the gravitational force. Um, when we calculate the electric force, it's some constant K, it's the Coulomb constant. K is large. What this tells us, one of the things that K tell, tells us is that the electric force is a very large force. I don't need a lot of charge from the electric force to get an appreciable force as opposed to the gravitational force, which is a very, very small force, G is equal to 
6.67 times 10 to the negative 11th. I need a lot of mass to get a gravitational force. Gravity is a weak force. Electricity is a strong force. Times one charge times the other charge over the distance separating them squared. So it's the same type of one over R squared force. So if we start off with, we'll call this force one, it's KQQ over R, uh, and then each of those Qs drops down to half its initial value. Force two is K times one half Q1 times one half Q2 over R squared. So I get one fourth K Q1 Q2 over R squared. Force two is one fourth. I substitute this of force one. So I get one fourth of that force. All right, that's our time. Thank you for watching.